during our, uh, so Stephanie alluded to it a little bit with uh, our eldest, but um, our eldest daughter during the diagnosis processing took a long time and the journey there is significant. But looking back on it, um, you know, it took a long time. It took a handful of uh, different rule out type of activities and, you know, arguably a couple of misdiagnoses before we landed in the right place. So from experience, what are you seeing as a common misdiagnosis uh, before you actually land in the right place? So I was, you know, like for my, for my own self, um, because I had such um, a significantly um, traumatizing childhood, they never suspected anything else for me other than CPTSD. So I strangely ended up not getting all the other diagnoses, even though I had, <laughs> I could have gotten them all. Um, so we know, so there's misdiagnosis and then there's the co-occurring diagnoses. And quite often the girls end up getting the co-occurring diagnoses and they'll think that that's all there is, you know? Um, and uh, so the biggest one being the social anxiety. It's it's almost, I remember when I did my training, um, you know, on with ADHD, um, regarding ADHD and autism, that they said, you know, ADHD is the number two co-occurring diagnosis, but should really be the number one, because if you've got autism, you've got social anxiety. Um, so, we see the girls getting diagnosed with social anxiety, general anxiety disorder, OCD and selective mutism, um, things like that, um, depression. One of the interesting things just coming back to the OCD is the research on that they found is that if you've got autism, you've got OCD, like you qualify for that by the DSM criteria. The difference they found between pathological OCD, like obsessive compulsive disorder and um, non-pathological is that autistics um, aren't distressed by their obsessions and compulsions like those actually calm me and um, whereas you know but many of us struggle with the with some of the more challenging obsessions and compulsions um, the girls we also see have eating disorders um, you know um, self-harm is huge borderline personality disorder is another um, big one um, and we um, I'm just trying to think in terms of that in terms of I guess because it's like a kind of in terms of the borderline personality disorder I'm not quite sure how I feel about the research at this point I do know that that's a huge one that we get diagnosed with um, and when you read the traits um, you can see why, but it's a very detrimental disorder to give to somebody who doesn't have that disorder because, um, you know, therapists are trained, don't take more than two borderline personality disorder clients into your practice. Uh, doctors are more likely to turn them away. You, you know, it's, even when a person's got an autism diagnosis, quite often it's like when you're having this meltdown or you're stressed out, people will say, oh, it's just borderline personality disorder. And it's easy to see why they kind of think that because we have, you know, high suicide doubt, like, you know, parasuicidal thought thinking, um, you know, the meltdowns, the intensity, all of that. But one of the distinctions that I think about anyways in my in my training with personality disorders because I used to work with people with that was that personality disorders um, are missing an ability to self-reflect which an autistic has a hot like that's all we're doing right it's like right from little it's like what's wrong with me what's going on with me if I do this then that and so when you're working with people with personality disorders you're teaching cause and effect so if you talk to people like that, they're not gonna respond well is what is happening in, in the personality disorders. And they have a hard time understanding that because in the brain, in the frontal lobe, there's actually um, a part of the brain that in other people, you know, the self-reflection, but is missing there. So I'm not quite like, I would think that's the biggest one that we often get misdiagnosed with and I'm not really sure in terms of how I feel about the co-occurrence. There's research saying that, but there's a lot of 
disaster in the research because, for example, when we look at alexithymia that 50% of us have, um, you know, you see, you're looking at autistic that can recognize less facial expressions um, and understand less vocal um, differences, et cetera, and, you know, and that's a traumatized autistic. So I think we're only starting to kind of tear this apart in the research now. So I'm not quite sure like about a lot of these things. Like I think, you know, we're, many of us have the eating disorders. Like it's, it's when you're, when you're doing the assessment, it's almost, it's, it's almost hard to find like somebody that, you know, it's like, I gotta kind of go, okay, like bullying check, you know, eating disorder check. And um, it's 50 to 70% of us that have ADHD. So it's more common in autism to have the ADHD than not. Um, but when we're looking at somebody with ADHD, they're not struggling with those social, um, um, in, this, in the social area in the same way that autistic is. So the reciprocity and reading social cues are more problematic for the autistic. Um, with ADHD alone, you can read the cues, but you, might miss them due to distraction, but you can understand them. You know, it's like when I'm watching a movie, I misunderstand a lot. So I quite often will read the summary, read what people think about it, and then go watch the movie. Otherwise, it can be difficult for me to enjoy the movie. Right. So. Well, I wanted to hear what you had to say before I shared our story, because um, some listeners, you may be hearing us for the very first time, and we don't often talk about our daughter. We talk more about a relationship, but our story matches exactly um, what Dr. Natalie has just said. So I'll kind of give you all the Reader's Digest version. Um, we didn't know or think our daughter was on the spectrum until she was school age. I mean, I thought she was maybe OCD because she lined things up and things had to be in a certain color. And, and as a therapist, I was like, oh, well, we're, you know, we're gonna nip this in the bud. Um, but like you said, the big difference is it calmed her she had joy there was joy in her lining things up whether today it was by color or today it was by the doll's hair or um by how she watched the movie i mean she was just constantly you know lining things up and i was like hmm, that seems a little bit different but um because she was our first child and super smart we just thought she was precocious and delightful and a talking you know encyclopedia and we thought that was quite cute that that was not a problem for us um the problem came in school um, because she began eloping or escaping um, when she would become dysregulated. And what the school didn't understand is it was happening during transitions. Um, yeah, that was usually the common one. So it took a two year process. And um, while she had um, some behaviors that the school didn't necessarily appreciate, the behaviors are actually what helped us get the diagnosis because she would have blended in and camouflaged. Um, just being a smart girl would be great. The teachers love smart kids who know all the answers. Um, but because she kept eloping, but our history, um, her first wrong diagnosis was ADHD, um, then pediatric bipolar, intermittent explosive disorder, OCD, and then sensory dysregulation disorder. And then, oh, it's just an anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder. And then as a teenager, one of her friends said, you don't have autism, you just have borderline personality disorder, which then got stuck in her head. And like, nope. <laughs> You're diagnosed when you are five or six years old, and that is a teenager that does not have a, a background. Um, so the, she did get reassessed, and um, originally it was Asperger syndrome, and then it was um, autism level one. So there was so much misunderstanding. The school was so focused on her behavior, like we've got to keep her from eloping from the classroom, or we've got it. She's not allowed to have a meltdown um, until they really started understanding. It was transitions. It was noising noises. It was timing her on testing quizzes. It was telling her, you'll be able to do this after you do this and then changing your mind. Um, these were the problems. And uh, one day I just was doing some research and I was like, well, if you take the OCD and the anxiety and the ADHD and the intermittent explosive disorder and, and the sensory stuff, it seems like that all comes together for a bigger picture of this thing I heard in school called Asperger's that I was never supposed to see, but I'm seeing it. <laughs> And that's kind of what led us down that road. Um, and for many years, I was so focused on women and girls on the spectrum. We missed Dan, who didn't get identified until 2019, um, because I was so focused on women and girls on the spectrum and, and the different presentation. Um, anything else didn't even like cross my mind for a little bit. So our story matches exactly what you're saying in a clinical perspective.